assistant, Alice Mary, um, talking about diagrams and automation. Um, yes. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> We're going to do something dangerous at the end, which is a of software, that is something which never works. So I, I have him here so that he screws up and he gets the plan. Otherwise, I would have screwed up. Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so, no hyper spaces here, definitely no two hyper spaces. Uh, let's see. What the man himself had to say. So, in 1932, some phenomena formalized quantum mechanics in mathematics, you couldn't like in that quantum mechanic. <coughs> Three years later, he wrote the book for the like to make confession, which may seem immoral. I do not believe absolutely in Hilbert space no more. <laughs> Definitely not two Hilbert spaces. <laughs> uh, anyway, they wrote a paper, The Logic of Quantum Mechanics, some people may have heard about that. There's a huge community of, there was a huge community of people working on that sort of stuff. Uh, it was a big failure because you don't find these in any textbook or anything like that, I would say. Uh, right, so, build space stuff. This is stuff filled with space made up from. So you better continue with a field stretch of complex numbers, vector spaces in a product, all that. But why? So why, why should we use that? Again, again, let's ask, let's ask for Neumann again. He only used it because it was available. He said it himself. I used it because he was there. And if you look back like, uh, to modern model theory, and you know that you can do anything with those spaces. They have such a generic structure. So they, they actually don't, don't teach you much. They come with little conceptual problems. On the other hand, uh, the grandfather of that thing there, uh, uh, he, actually had, he actually had another idea than the Norman at the same time. And uh, uh, so he, he actually said, he took some of one theory our systems composed. Like if you take two systems away to start behaving, that's the true soul. So basically this is what we want to solve. You want to get rid of all the other hill space stuff, but you want to retain the tensor product. Nothing but the tensor product. So so conceptually is that we are not we don't want to talk about properties of the individual but about relationships. That sort of relational view of things, you can say. And mathematically is you want to rationalize an abstract tensor product without a reference to underlying spaces. So that we have got some some freedom to play later, which so no commitment to help spaces. Uh, so, <clears throat> so the game plan is going to be which assumption, <coughs> like which structure, do we then, after we've solved this, have to put on the tensor to actually deduce physical phenomena? So it's a, it's, it's a sort of game. It's a game. Like how little do we, have, how much do we have to assume to to actually predict physical phenomena? And in a way. This is sort of akin to what you can say what people are looking at a lot, a lot now, like this framework for generalized probabilistic theories. This is going to be a framework for generalized process theories. But it's sort of a different thing, but you've got many different models, like, uh, like Terry mentioned before, for example. For speculative story theory, much happier lives here than, as I say, generalized probabilistic theory. It, it naturally lives here. There's a very simple uh, categorical description. And um, so it also sort of gives you some operational bones for the quantum foundations, you could say. Uh, now, an additional question. So I wasn't planning to talk about this yesterday in the pub. Some people are saying that I should talk about it. Uh, so we're going to take this structure and see whether it defines elsewhere in our classical reality. Now, I mean something very special in classical reality. It's everything we conceive as no quantum say. So that's a lot of stuff. And uh, I keep it. So anyway. So. And this is the outcome, so that's all my answer. So basically the main result of approaching quantum physics axiomatically from the tensor product as opposed to other programs like quantum logic, uh, convex theories, is you need, you need very, very little assumptions to actually produce a lot of results. So you, you got a very big ratio to how much you can prove with very little. Uh, I'll, I'll give some examples then. Uh, exposing these structures as unlike what Terry said, help to I'll give some examples, I'll solve some problems elsewhere. And uh, so the result is basically, a very, we saw this in the previous talk, a very simple, intuitive, but rigorous diagrammatic language. So your axiomatic structure is actually a diagrammatic language. So it, it's it's monoidal category. It's very close to the two categories, but it, it's a little bit different. It's, it's, it's very related. Well, anyway, so, so and people people now, this bunch of people with quantum foundations like Lucian and, and Giro Kiribello now, take this graphical framework as a basis for sort of their, their research in quantum foundations. So if, I, if, if I've done anything, like I've contributed a new word to English language, it's this one. <laughs> right, so here is a bunch of papers. 
of results which came out of this framework which are sort of relevant to quantum computing, I would say. So this is what the measurement based quantum computing, Ross is going to talk about that. Uh, this is what multi-part I found, this is going to be part of our tech demo. So class is something for topological cluster state computation, which we hear about this morning too. Uh, and I recently Pizuren also did something about quantum networks and protocols. So this, this is the first time Decker compact category is in the title of the PRL stack. <laughs> anyway, so oh yeah, Alex, Alex Kissinger will talk tomorrow about uh, some results to do with non-locality and generalized learning arguments. Right, okay. So this, this is sort of our teleportation. Notice the list, you see it's very different than JB's story, but anyway, so I'll explain how this works. Uh, now, this is something completely different. Basically, you see, this looks very much the same. It looks very much the same, it's the same logical structure, same kind of pictures. Uh, but it, it is, this is making a different statement. This is like behavior of many, this is just like somebody is always annoying. <laughs> and, uh, but, but what this is, is actually reasoning about meaning in natural language. And I'll explain, I'll, I'm going to talk about this because we yeah, all talk about how this works. But this actually literally came out of this research. And this, this is solving a problem in natural language processing which was open for a long time. So I'll, I'll say how this works. Uh, <coughs> and then here is another thing which again looks very similar. Don't, don't be scared by the fact that here are square boxes or something like that. Essentially it's all the same. And this is like a reasoning about Bayesian inference. This is uh, some work we got back in And we use again the same language. So, so this is for example, uh, this is pooling, this is pooling. Uh, so you can just reason with the same kind of logic about probabilistic stuff. So that, that's what I meant by, do we find these structures elsewhere in a classical reality? Yeah. Language, language, that's the origin of logic. Like, uh, like Boolean logic came out of the fact that, you know, you know Senna say yes and no, if then. That's, that's, that's where logic comes from. So this is actually, but uh, logic in language is very Boolean still. It's like true or false very much. Well, this is actually about, this is reasoning about meaning. Generally, like meaning is something else than true or false. Right? And this is really reasoning about meaning. Uh, so, I'll explain it later on this work. But I think the interesting part is that this sort of logic you use to, to reason about quantum stuff, they can be applied elsewhere. And they, they seem to solve problems there. Right. Okay, so. And, the fact that we are dealing with something like a general logic, hopefully it will be uh, illustrated at the end of the talk. So we've got some software which does the reasoning for you, which automates. So that's, that's the upshot of working with a discrete graphical language. You can actually stick it in a computer and make the computer do the reasoning for you. So we're going to do a little demo at the end about that. Right, so that quick, I know many people have seen this a million times, so, so I'll go quick. So this is just a minimal language. So basically what you got, you got processes. Processes are represented by boxes. They may have an input and an output, like here. And then you can actually compose processes. You just connect the output of one process to the input of another. Or you can also put them in parallel, just do them side by side. That's another thing you can do. Uh, so that, that's the language. That's the language. It was initially introduced by Penrose to reason about tensor networks and things like that. So implicitly, there is this, this idea of compose, composing is like a very prime word. This is like one system, this is a composition of systems, just putting a bunch of wires side by side, <coughs> no system, yeah, okay. A state doesn't have an input, a state just has an output. You don't care where it comes from, you care about the fact that you can do something in a state. Uh, and people can ask, is this merely a, a, a new notation? And then you look at an equation like that, and for example, if you want to write down the left, left hand side, G after F, K after H, and then you put things side by side. And this, this, this is an equation which is true for, uh, say, linear maps and the task of product. You can check. This is like a little exercise. And in, that, in this language, it's just a topology. So you don't have to get totally this complete trivial. And there's a bunch of. And the, thi the thing is, the reason for this is that, that these two operations, composition and tensor, they like to live in two dimensions. They don't like to live in one dimension. Because they do sort of orthogonal things to each other, and that's why they. So basically, 
because of force in every one dimension, you get you have to sort of impose equations like this, which actually don't have real meaning, which are sort of tautologies. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Is that this, this basically means peel the potato and then fry it while peeling the carrot and boil it the same as peel the potato or peeling the carrot and fry the potato or boil the carrot. You can try this, this is true. <laughs> right. Okay, so what we're uh, going to do now is we're going to add a tiny bit of extra structure uh, and see how quickly we get to anything quantum mechanically relevant. So one thing we are going to do is this is like almost like imposing a metric. But so in this graphical language, imposing a metric is something like that. You say for each box of this kind, there is a box of this kind. Which means you're allowed to flip your boxes. And if you flip twice, then you get the original again. So that's, that, this corresponds to the linear algebra of that in the edge one. But it's, it's here, it's just like this diagrammatic thing. And then the second thing, second thing we want to impose is since, since we say it's all about the tensor product, we at least have to say something about the tensor product, how that it's different to the classical, to a Cartesian product or something like that. Although, so basically, quantum, in case of pure states, what we have is that if you give a description of two systems, there's no way you can all, not always describe this by describing the individuals, right? So you go to the back and say, classically, you can do that in the pure world. And so how are we going to serve this in our language? Well, basically, we're going to say there exists a piece of wire, a piece of wire, and this is a topological thing Jamie was, Jamie was emphasizing, and we just stick it here. If you stick a piece of wire here, of course we can't split it up. But, and we're just going to treat this like these wires. But it's kind of a funny one. It has, it, it has two outputs. It's not sort of neat, but are just two outputs. And uh, basically the rule is subject, is, uh, subject to the following rule, all the topology maps. You can do anything with it, and then the sort of typical equation is this one. This, 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 so here you've got something coming in, and then it does something, and something coming out. And the only topology matters, so it's true. Right, so now how do you get to teleportation? Well, first we're going to define a new concept. Given a box, given a box like this, we define a box like this, which we uh, denote by rotating it 180 degrees. And what it means is actually that you put a piece of wire here and you put a piece of wire there. Could you guess what is this in linear algebra? Let me guess. This, this is a bell state. Think of this as a bell state. So if you take a linear map, you stick a bell state here, and then this is, a, uh, this is an effect, bell effect. So what is this? These are all the quantum physics people in What? No, no, what is this? This is a, this, this, this is a matrix. This is a matrix. This is a matrix. Yeah. Given this matrix, what is this matrix? It's like sort of just in your net and so on. Transpose. The transpose. That's a transpose. So people, yeah, you don't realize it, but it's just if you take a whole state, you take it. It's very easy, you see this immediately with the transpose. So. <laughs> Uh, okay, so you take a box, you define a new box, so a, a sort of right internal structure here. So you've got a small box, you've got a big box, so you've got a piece of wire here, a piece of wire here, and I'm just adding two pieces of wire. Now I can do a couple of things. I, I hide the internal structure here, just I'll take the outside and hide the inside like this. Uh, if I take this piece of wire and yank it, I end up here. If I take this piece of wire and yank it, I end up there. Now you see the result is. It's as if you can take these boxes and sort of slide over these wires. This was just a clever choice of how to represent the transpose. That's what it was. So now, now, now there is this idea that you've got some sort of wire or a chain and there's beads and you can sort of push them through. And that's your formalism now. That's your formalism. So here, this is a true statement in my language. Because yeah? I can take this box and slide it, and so there, then I can just jam the wire. Uh, now, so uh, I can, I'm, I'm going to ask that this thing composed with its transpose is the identity, which means it is isometry or unitary if you want. Okay, so this goes away. Uh, and then you sort of introduce. Is that the transpose or is it the Huh? Is it the transpose or is it the 
Edgelines. Sleeping is edgelines. So that's then what I said is wrong. Everything you're doing is equivalent of Schmidt decomposition or maximum entangled state. Take I tends to F is the same as F negative tends to F. That's what is short to work. That's what is short to work. Okay. But you see what I'm saying? Like everything is on a belt there, and you add something on the one side, or it's like acting the transpose on the other side. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And you can find yeah. it all that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, this is still a like a, a general already explained how this works. So what, one of the things here is like, you see, this, this is an effect. This is an effect that depends on F, and this is the correction F. <coughs> so, so the sort of cl classical communication is implicit in this picture. It's not explicit. So what basically happens is Alice has to pick up her phone and say F to Bob, you know, Bob knows what to do that. So it would be nice, it would be nice if we also can sort of put this classical stuff in the picture. So I'm going to do that later. But first we go for something completely different. We've got time. I know that's the thing on this one. Yeah. I don't really know that, right? Yeah. Okay, something completely. Ah! <laughs> Damn it, what that Well, I'm going to be very quickly here. So basically, Basically, the statement here, this is theorem of Selinger. Yeah, so so the, the language which I've been present corresponds to a certain um, type of categories which are called dagger compact categories. That's the language which I've been presenting. So there is, an, there is a way that you can say this is an algebraic structure, this is a category, it satisfies this, 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 and that's a dagger compact category. So there are theorem, first there are theorems which say that whatever you can prove in the graphical language, you can prove symbolically and vice versa. Otherwise, you wouldn't even call it the graphical language of. That's not a surprise, because otherwise it would be silly to even use this graphical language. Now, here is a big, big and surprising result, and it's the fact that everything you can express in the language I've presented to you, well, everything you can express, uh, well, an equational statement between such things is true in Hilbert spaces, even though it's true in the graphical language. So, there's nothing more you can prove in Hilbert spaces. For the fragment of the language, you can express in this dagger category. Uh, com so these are the things you can talk about. In this so of course, states, operations, effects, unitary, the edge joints, projections, conjugation, complete positivity. So there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff which you can actually already express in this language. In the phrase, in the product. So any equational statements about these concepts. You can prove in the graphical language, even only if you can prove them in those space. So that's a fair and strong result. That's a sort of surprising result. Uh, due to Peterson. Okay, now for something completely different. So it's surprising to you because you thought in the other space you could do more or you could do less? Uh, you would have expected that you can prove more because you've got more equations. So, so the Hilbert space is one particular model of dagger compact categories. One particular. So, so, so the concept is more abstract, the category. So it has less equations. Every specific model really invoke more equations, so you can prove more. That's the thing. So you, you would have So obviously everything you prove in a graphical language would always be true in any model. It's the, the, the fact that that it's only true, even though it's true in the model, that's a very strong thing. That's logical, that's a logical score for Pleiades theory. But that's a strong thing. Uh, okay, now for something completely different. This is joint work with Ali, Steve Clark, and Manoush. Is he in the, are you in the room? Yeah, he's in the Right. So, and this is like proof of concept that we're dealing with some with a new type of logic here, which, which is not just specific about quantum mechanics, but like also transcendence different fields. Uh, so, consider, so consider the meaning of words here. Uh, what does the meaning of a word mean? Well, it's what you find in the dictionary, right? That's, that's the meaning of a word. Huh? You can also have a more mathematical model of meaning, which, which you would use in practical applications. Let's like say, for example, for example when, when you're when you building web browsers. And a sort of model of meaning, which is now sort of common, is called distributional model of meaning. What you do is you take a basis of context words, and then you're going to look up in a big corpus of text and see how many times a certain word appears in the context of these words. And you, you, you assign relative frequencies, and that gives you a vector. Right? And this vector represents the meaning. And then, for example, if two words have very similar meaning, you would expect these vectors to be very 
are similar. So by computing the inner product, you can sort of measure similarity of words. So that's, that's, that's a very standard model people use and behind all the practical applications. Now, the problem which was open, so what is the meaning of a sentence made up of these words? So we don't have dictionaries for sentences. So how do we know the meaning of a sentence? How do we do that, for example? We, we, we seem to have a way. That it's, you, you hear sentences you never hear before and you know what they mean. So there, there, there must be some mechanism there. And you also want to machines then to use this mechanism. So, so the, thing, the thing which clearly mediates stuff well, is the grammar. You know, the grammar, the sort of thing which, which tells you that actually if you've got a string of words, whether well, it actually has a significant meaning, meaning is it a sentence. So the grammar does something for you there. And I'm going to be very brief here because uh, this, this, this would be talking is all right otherwise. But um, so if you then start thinking about about sort of grammatical types like a verb, a verb is like a compound system, like a compound quantum system, consisting of three systems. One is waiting for an object, one is waiting for a subject, and the other one spits out the sentence. That's sort of the flow of meaning if you've got a transitive verb. And evidently, evidently, we are again in such a situation. That if this would be sort of disconnected, it would mean that this would be independent of what comes in here and what comes in there. So, so, for example, if one person would hate another person, then everybody hates everybody. Because hating is independent on the, on the object, uh, object and subject. Then. So, okay. So, right? And then it turns out that you, you go to the library, you, you, you ask uh, are people, are the people thinking about the structure of grammar a little bit, and then you find this field of algebra. This is Guy Jim Lombeck who came up with that in 1990. He started this whole business actually in the 50s, structure of mathematical language, but he didn't wrote it like that. He wrote the equations, but this is what it means. This was his theory. And I'm just going to give a very quick example before I go on. So you can open his book and he'll tell you then this is the grammar. So he got this, this sentence here. Terry does not like Bob. Okay. Uh, and then this, this bit here on top is what your textbook would tell you is the grammatical structure. We encoded in these things which I just showed you. And these things are just factors. These are meaning vectors, like I mentioned before. And the idea is now that what comes out here is the meaning of the sentence. So you take this grammatical structure, you interpret this as this linear maps, like we were just doing before when we were discussing teleportation, and you apply this to your meaning vectors of words, and you see what comes out. And you can, you can, you can actually do more. Like for example, like a word like "does," "does" doesn't really do anything, and "not" well, it, it negates. So you can sort of give rather than a, than getting some vector here via some mechanical method, you can actually sort of put some logical content to it. So here, this is "does," and then you you do your yanking bit, and then you see that the meaning of meaning of the sentence is. So basically, you see, you just follow this. This comes in here, yeah, and this goes in there, and then this goes in here, passes through not, goes in there. So, so the meaning of Terry does not like Bob is Terry like Bob not. That's what it is. Now, this is sort of more a logical example. That, so basically, what these these things are doing, they are sort of making these words interact in something that communicate. So sort of teleporting your information from front to top. So this is a, these are experiments at Graphic Set the Student that we did on, on some really concrete tasks. So this is about word disambiguation. They like concrete net and they outperform the older methods. So they did well. That's them. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going back to the to the to the quantum mechanics thing. Uh, so far, we have been talking about a fairly minimal language, and I actually also want to say something about observables, classical data, this sort of stuff. So we need to enrich our language a little bit, and rather rather than just having wires, just rather than just having wires, we now will allow for nodes with multiple wi wires coming out. So. The branching, there is some branching possible. Uh, do I have good reason? And to do that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later. So basically, you, you, 
you assume that you've got some family of spiders, like so these are nodes with lots of wires coming out, and it's one composition rule. Like basically, if you see two spiders like that, and they meet each other, and they sort of fuse together in a single spider. It's a little bit like, like Jamie's regions. Jamie's regions are like webs of these spiders. That's what they are, webs of these spiders. Uh, Anyway, so, so there are some implicit, so this, this may look very, very awkward, but if, if I, for example, show you this, so this is a spider with two on top and one down, and you can think of this like something like a multiplication. You take two things in, so one thing goes out, and then you see that this particular equation is sort of saying, yeah, associativity. doesn't really matter in which order I multiply stuff, associativity. So this is like associativity. And then... <coughs> This is another equation which you see there, and you hear Jamie mentioning Frobenius. Frobenius, this is Frobenius' law. He coded in spite of things. Anyway, <coughs> there is a, the main thing is that you've got the following theorem, that in any dagger symmetric monoidal category, such families of spiders, and that's dagger special community, Frobenius and other are exactly the same thing. This is just like one step of the other thing, which is that's something we proved, that in the specific case of Hilbert spaces, Dagger special Frobenius orders are exactly ortho orthonormal bases. So this, however weird it may look, if, if such a family of spiders is the same thing as an orthonormal basis, it's the same thing. And the intuition you should have is because of the no-cloning theorem. So what, what this, whenever you got something like this, whenever you got something like this, you know, this is like a copying operation, and the only thing you can copy is the basis. So this kind of captures the idea of having a basis. Uh, the sort of the, the, the somewhat more surprising thing is that anything which obeys this is always a basis. So, <coughs> so anyway, I didn't want to show that yet. So okay, so basically we have a, a way now to. Basically what you're doing is you're, right, you're talking about orthonormal bases by using the tensor structure only. That's what this is. Like using tensor structure as the only language you have and then still say what an orthonormal basis is. So that's, that's what these spiders do. And here is a funny one. Like, you remember the anchor thing? So if I take now this guy here, the other one upside down here, then you see that this composite, the anchor thing is sort of implicit in the this spider reasoning. So it's, it's sort of a natural generalization. You can think like dagger compact categories are about Hilbert spaces, and these Rubinus algebras are about Hilbert spaces with bases. That's sort of the, the analogy I, I would put there. Okay, so you want to go on. What does it mean to be complementary? What does it mean to be complementary for two observables? Basically, what you've done is you've got one family of green spiders. One family of red spiders, so they each correspond with an, with an orthonormal basis in Hilbert space. So what does it mean for spider behavior that they are complementary? This is what it means. So if a red spider means a green spider like with an even number of hands, then these hands fall off. That's on the nose. That's on the nose too. Actually, actually sometimes you have to stick into something here, but I'm not going to discuss it. How are you defining complementary? Uh, unbiases, 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 unbiased, mutually unbiased basis. It's the of yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that was the original one I thought. of teleportation where we didn't have a wire. And now I claim this is, this is actually it may not may not look like it is textbook teleportation because uh, the like a green dot with a wire coming in uh, this is really like a control control yeah. control Z and this is control X. This is control X and here sort of it's sort of like extracting X and extracting Z and uh, 
this dot, so I didn't introduce that symbol, this, this subject to some actions, but it's totally unimportant for what I'm doing here. This really means coupling to the environment. So you take some of these dots and you couple them to the environment. What you see here is like here you have the red dot and there you have the green dot. And basically what this means, what this in input space would mean is here your classical data is encoded in plus and minus and there in zero and one. But it's just the natural elegant way how things come together. And you'll see how we use now this, this notion of form. So basically, okay, so this is a different, this is a different setting that it's not just a single wire anymore. Not just a single wire anymore. What can we do? We use our spider principles, pi. Don't know whether you see what happened. So I just take these two things on the left and I slide them to the other side. You see that? So I take this red dot, I slide them to this side, and also then the green one follows. And then you see immediately, you see it here, this configuration. So this is going to fall away, and these two green can come together, fall away, and then you've got these two pieces of classical data hanging in the air and your teleportation is realized. Um, okay, we have 10 minutes left, I think. So, <coughs> so basically, so th these green and red dots, every of these uh, spider, uh, spiders, they actually also come with a, with a group structure, which, uh, which we call a phase group. And it, it happens to be, this is just the fact that points which are embraced for an observer will be, behave very well with respect to the spiders and composition. And you can actually just de decorate spiders with unbiased points. And they just add up, I'm not gonna, they just add up according to some group structure. There's this, this is just, this is not for Hilbert's, completely Hilbert space reasons, this is for abstract reasons that you always have a natural group structure on these spiders. And that now, if you, got, if you take these spiders with these faces, then you've got a universal language, which means you can write down every linear map. So that's, that gives you a language which is rich enough. And this is the sort of stuff uh, Rosa and Simon Pedrix have been using to do stuff in metaphor-based quantum computing, which naturally, which, which, which very naturally, this language is particularly suited for that metaphor-based quantum, and this is what Claire did some stuff with <coughs> So Rosa is going to talk about it tomorrow, I think, yeah? Uh, <coughs> so right, that's, that's what Perry was hinting at, like we did this work on spec and story theory, and I was just mentioning this group which naturally, naturally lives on spiders. And so one question was, what is the difference between stabilizer quantum mechanics and spec and story theory? And it's actually that these groups which live on the spiders are different. One is Z4, and the other one is Z2 times Z2. And you can also show that this factorization is responsible for the fact that no locality breaks down. Such a, such a group factors me. Yeah, I think Alex is maybe going to say things about that. So we recently have a new paper which we put on the Merlin on the, on the archive last Friday, and which says that which identifies a stronger form of complementarity than the one I, I presented of you maybe you don't have a point like that. And Merlin generalized Merlin type arguments, it's sort of this sort of strong form of complementarity is necessary to have sort of non locality argument. I think Alex is gonna talk about that tomorrow. Okay, G and Z and W, I quickly have to say that. So I just talked about like spiders representing observables and complementary observables, but you can actually play the game also differently. So what, another question we, which we asked is like, um, your observable spiders are like G and Z spiders. You could say, because basically I said this is about copying, so zero is copied to zero, zero, one is copied to one, one. So what would be W spiders? Is that it's not how we ask the question because we didn't think there would be any. But, uh, so if you start to think of a W state in a similar way as you can think of a GNC state as a basis, what happens? And it turns out that you obey exactly the same actions, except for one which is different. But one rule of our spiders was that if you got a loop, then you can sort of do it away. For W, if you got a loop, it sort of breaks up in two things. It's kind of funny. So, so basically, so this is this is G and Z spiders. Basically, they just compose. For W, if the spiders meet in one leg, then then they fuse together. If they meet in two legs, then they explode. So that's W state, exploding spiders. Right. Uh, and something something else which is which is kind of interesting is you can. 
treat these dots as multiplications, which I have said, and there is an encoding of the qubit, where actually GHC is like multiplication and W is a, like addition, and they distribute over each other. Uh, so basically, the interaction of GHC and W, if you start plugging them together in a sort of way you've been doing, is really like just arithmetic. Then W is plus, GHC is times. And we're going to show, uh, Alex is now going to show a demo in which he's going to do 2 plus 3 by means of W and GHC. <laughs> Control knot, a control knot the other way around, and then the third control knot the original way around. Um, what's this going to end up as? Okay, so what we're going to demonstrate is that this will actually uh, do this, uh, we'll actually show you this uh, in the calculus. Uh, so this is a, a biological law. A strong complement therapy, like I mentioned. to do flashy animations. So. Uh, we get that splitting you know, before and then we get a swap out of it. So <laughs> pardon? Uh, okay, so that's something you can show in the red green calculus and the quantumatic will actually show for you. Now this um, so if you haven't seen the measurement calculus before, this is an example of some sort of measurement calculus. Um, so, a uh, quick introduction for those of you who haven't seen it. Uh, this, uh, they're indexed uh, on qubits. So, the way I've laid out this diagram, each one of these lines is a qubit. Uh, and we're indexing one, two, three, four, five. So, n means we're creating in the state plus, which is just the green dots, and that's a 2, 3, 4, and 5. You can see you've got green dots at the top. Uh, implicitly, that means 1 is an input. Uh, we have entanglement operations, which are uh, these, which you can see, and then measurement operations with angles alpha, which is a on that, uh, beta, gamma, and zero. So they should actually aid in C. And implicitly, because we haven't measured qubit 5, we get an output. So I'm going to uh, get quantum matter to do the rewriting again. Uh, this implements an arbitrary uh, unit tree based on its Euler decomposition, which we can also write like this, and that's what we're hoping to get out of it. We actually won't get quite that out of it because of the way the order in which the rules are applied. Um, but you can see, so we can push the Hadamard through this, which will change the colour because um, Hadamard's uh, put between the X and Z places. Uh, and then push it through this one as well, which will change that to red. And then Hadamard's self inverse. So we actually, if we did push that through, we would get this. Uh, the reason the rules aren't in, so down the this side you can see the rules. Chris, and I'll show you an example of one in a moment. Uh, the reason rules like that aren't written in is because of the danger of getting infinite loops in our rewriting process. 
Uh, our aim is to make quantum a bit more intelligent as well. That sort of thing. Um, we can't. We can do the black other graphical calculi in quantum math as well. Uh, I'm going to show you an example in the black and white calculus. GACW. GACW. Um, which, as uh, Bob said, we're going to get uh, a bit of this is a little bit of a gimmick, really, uh, because obviously it's a horrendously inefficient way to do addition. So, what we have uh, is uh, we represent our numbers in unary. So, in particular, that is zero, that is one. That's two and so on. Uh, so here we have three, here we have zero, here we have two. The black dots, which are the W uh, spiders, are addition, and the white dots are multiplication. Uh, most of the rules we've got in here are just, so these are all just the spider rules that Bob was showing you earlier. Uh, the only uh, extra one is distributivity, which I'm going to show you the rule for now. Um, okay, so distributivity, as you're familiar with it, looks something like this. This is something that is true in the GSOW calculus. Um, if you want to check out the proof, it's in paper that's on the archive uh, that was about there last year uh, on rational arithmetic in GHW calculus. Um, this particular form of the rule we've got here uh, is actually this one. So what we've done is we've replaced, because we can't, don't really have a way of describing how to copy arbitrary graphs, we've constrained this to be a number and we're going to do it um, uh, one by one. We're going to move the things across one by one uh, by treating this unary number as that plus that. Uh, so, I should explain a little bit about this. Um, these are half edges that can be connected to anything. Um, the rest of the graph and the same here. So we're describing some subgraph with a well-defined boundary and they match up with the ones on the other side. These are what we call bang boxes which if you're familiar with linear logic uh, bear some relation to the bang operator in linear logic. Basically it means we can we can delete these subgraphs or we can copy them along with all their incoming and outgoing edges. Uh, but the point when we have a rule we have matching bank boxes and we have to do the same to both sides. So I hope you can see that if we have a particular number here, as in a particular number of copies of this bank box, we get two copies of the same number on that side. And here, uh, this one is this part here, where we've got some number of copies of things. We go. Two plus three. Yeah, we go back to two plus. Well, it's actually two, so the num what we're implementing here is two times zero plus three. Just so you get some addition in there as well. Uh, so the first couple of steps are fairly straightforward spider rules. Uh, then we get the distributivity law. So there are actually two ways this can be Applied. Uh, we can apply it that way around, or we get a lot of copies of the same thing because a lot of these applications of the rules are symmetric. So you can see the two ways it highlights it, there are two different ways we can apply distributivity law. Um, right. This is the bit where, whenever you're doing a software demo, <laughs> the trick is to find the bugs and avoid them. Unfortunately, this was one I couldn't avoid. Uh, the, the fact that if your rewrite affects a large part of the graph, it, the layout goes to a little place. Luckily, we have a cheat way of uh, sorting that out. 
So now we distribute things over. Uh, we've distributed uh, one of the numbers. Uh, so this is our three. We distributed it across uh, the two on the other side. And then everything else is. <coughs> Well, yeah, okay, so then I should still, I need to say what dimension 6 is then, right? Yeah, yeah. you need a way of relating it back to the number. What? So the loop. We, yeah, the number 6 is the loop. The number 6 is just a circle. If, if you draw a circle in the calculus, it's the dimension of the, of the space. Uh, well, part of this uh, Salinger completeness theorem is you have to let all your variables be free. So one of the things is the spaces you're working over. So. Mm. In that in that sense, you do have to go to something more concrete to, to make an assumption like dimension or something like that that falls apart. Okay, I just wanted to say there's a way of coding that in somehow. Um, yeah, because six is a constant, it's not an actual number. She would be part of that into the statement somewhere. Well, I guess you can once you start putting these algebraic structures on, but specifically, I mean, there's no kind of broad answer to that, I don't think. It's kind of, you put, you, you put what you put in, and then you get out what you get out with these kinds of things. Because we have a good chance, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically the same question. It's, it's, uh, so, it, is this the number of uh, mutually unbiased spaces that you have here, like three counts three, is it put from outside, or, or if I assume four, do I get some inconsistency in my topology, or... So what's the relation between the dimension of Hubert space and, and the number one? Dimension is not very present in the calculus. That's the, we have a specific calculus which is only true for two dimensions because there's a lot more equations. So one thing I wanted to say is like, so this, this, is, just, this is the rewriting. This is the rewriting. So this is like automated reasoning. But the next stage, which, which Alex already worked on, is automated theory generation. So we basically, we have a few big theory, which is this red-green calculus, which has a bunch of equations, which are not true in three dimensions anymore. They're only true in two dimensions for qubit. Now with this automated theory generation, we could also produce automatically a new calculus for qubit. And then systematically, so for, you would expect that all the time there are different equations, less equations basically. And that would be the characterization of the dimension, which equations hold in which dimension. Clearly, so the but in, three, in 2D there is only three bases. Three bases. So he's just three, asking, is it clear that you can only have three colors So what would happen if I impose four colors? Okay. Uh, consistent theory or not? Uh, probably it should be coming. I would, I would imagine that more, it would be coming consistent. We only developed a three color one. We have a three color one. We never bothered to do four color one. <laughs> but, but then it can't match Gilbert's you would expect, you would expect, you would expect it would be, You would expect it to become logically inconsistent. That would actually be a result. Yeah. And then because you got in higher dimensions, you got less equations, you can actually have more of these things. 
because you've got less constraints. So that's probably the answer to the question, I think. The way to, we haven't done that. But so you would develop a theory for each, and we have this automate, automated theorem, the theory doing, because of, how is this working? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean <laughs> uh, the idea is that you push the button and you get a theory out of it, like one of these kinds. Yeah. Um, at some point you, you said something like, uh, you, from language you get logics. Yeah, um, that's where Aristotle got it from, right? I, 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 to me it would be more natural to say the other way around. Have logic and then you get language out of it. Could well, you explain? Like, no, no, you, like, you could say logic is something which underpins reasoning in language. Yeah, so that's fine. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I know. That's it. Uh, no, but yeah, but anyway, there's a type of the origin of log logic. These things, the, how, how are they call this stuff? Uh, Aristotle wrote down the syllogism. You know, sort of I mean, there wasn't. Anything deep in, in which comes no, it, was sort of, it was sort of justifying the word logic. Logic is something which which, which, which comes from language. So are you, are you, are you imposing some group structure as well onto the uh, complementary observer? So basically, when, when you got one of these spider things, one of these uh, observed spiders representing a basis, and they naturally come with group structure. Like if you look in the open spaces, it would be the, um, the unbiased. So for a cube, it would be all the unbiased points on the equator. And a conjugation is the, is, the, is, is the inverse, the group inverse. So you've got a group structure there. And they behave very well. So do they move? If you've got a spider work, you can move them around. And if you put them on the same spider, you just add them. You add these phases. So that's, that's a group structure which naturally lives there. Like I was saying, what characterizes, for example, the difference between the toy theory, which we hear about today, and stabilized quantum theory, is the fact that in one case you got Z4, and in one case you got Z2 times Z2, and you sort of feel with Z2 times Z2, there's no place to even having proper conjugates, because there's no non-trivial involutions on Z2. And so that's why the, the toy theory breaks down, and I sort of just feel that something of conjugation is gone, because of that. So you can, uh, and it's also no, no locality breaks down because of that. I think that, that might be a problem then if you wanted to address this mutual bias basic problem because we already know, for example, that you can't use the group structure of mutual bias basic in functions. You sort of have to get away from that. Like it just happens like in dimension two that the mutual bias basic functions nice group structure and that's, that's true constructively in higher dimensions, but if we want to prove that they don't exist, we have to we can't see that. Mm. Even one observer, so anyway, Alex is going to talk about tomorrow. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. okay, if there's no more questions, we'll thank Bob again.